I don't know about you, but uh, it's cold outside. Did you notice that? And you come in here and you get warm and then it's kind of hard to stay awake. And I'd like to think I am such a dynamic speaker that you wouldn't have that problem, but I know better than that. So uh, let's pray together and ask God to use His Word uh, to transform our hearts and get us uh, moved closer to Him and looking a little more like Jesus uh, as we leave this place. So let's go before Him and ask His blessing on this time, okay? Father, we thank you for the chance to open your word. We thank you, Father, you've taken the time to put it all together for us. And we know that there's one common thread from Genesis to Revelation, and that is Jesus. Our need for him to come, pay the penalty, to take the punishment for our sin on the cross, to be buried and raised again and give us that promise, that hope of eternal life with you. Father, right now we thank you that we are a part of a church. We are part of the church. Um, we know that the church is far more than NLCC. Uh, that, Father, you have people around the world that are worshiping uh, today. And, uh, Father, someday uh, maybe we'll get a chance to meet them, but they are still our brothers and sisters in Christ. Father, right now we just give this time to you and we pray that you'll use it to mold us into the image of your Son, in whose name we gather and we pray. Amen. I think you'll be glad to know I didn't bring my soapbox today. So, <laughs> you don't have to worry about that. Um, I'm kind of wrapping up this series on, um, I'm in, what, and basically it's what it, what it means to be a church member. And I just want to review real quick uh, the topics that we've covered. I'm not going to uh, expound on these uh, hardly at all. And I want them in front of me so I make sure I get them all in order. Uh, week one, we talked about the need to be a functioning member. 1 Corinthians 12 tells us that we are a part of the body of Christ. So does Romans 12. Um, and obviously, if you have a hand or an eye or a foot that's not functioning very well, uh, you feel it, right? Um, you are limited somewhat in what you do, and there are extra challenges uh, because of that. And so it is that God calls us to be a functioning member of His body, the church. And He reminds us that, like our human bodies, we have many members, uh, but, and each member has its own responsibility, its own function, its own role. And uh, if a member decides not to function, uh, then the whole body is impacted. It's true in the church as well. Second week, he said we need to be unifying members, members who work towards unity. Uh, obviously, uh, uh, the human body, like the body of Christ, can't be separated and uh, survive well. Um, the body is a unit, and the church body is a unit as well. When we come to Christ, we are automatically brought into the body of Christ. We are automatically brought into the church. And it is our responsibility, the scripture tells us, to do everything we can to keep that unity intact. That means a lot of things, and we don't have time to go through them. Uh, but uh, basically it means setting aside our personal agendas, because we all have things that we would like to see done. We all have methods that we would like to see practice. We all have opinions. Uh, and we need to set those aside, humble ourselves, and uh, keep the main thing the main thing, and that is glorifying God through building up the body of Christ and reaching out to the lost. The third week we talked about being a selfless Christian. Church isn't about you. Jesus is. If you put your hope in those people who are sitting in these pews or in the church leadership, you're going to be sorely disappointed. And a lot of people are. Uh, they come, uh, they fall in love with the congregation, and the minute they find themselves in conflict, or the minute they find themselves uh, realizing that the preacher has flaws, um, they're gone. The 
church is not about you. There's no way that we can meet your need. And our call is not to make you happy. Our call is to serve our Lord Jesus. And sometimes that will irritate you. Sometimes it will bring us into conflict. But Jesus is about you. And our job is to point you to him and pray like crazy and give you the tools to draw closer to him on a daily basis. A daily basis. Uh, that's up to you. So it's not about you. It's about him. Two weeks ago when I got on my soapbox, uh, we recognized that members need to be respectful members, respectful of their leadership. Hebrews 13 says, respect or obey or submit to the leaders that God has put over you. That's one of the ways we maintain our unity. And so it's really important um, in terms of who is an elder and who is not. And uh, uh, not everybody plays that role. Uh, we may be very active in the church. We uh, may be doing a lot of things. We may have a lot of people that uh, like us. Uh, but that doesn't necessarily mean that we need to be an elder. The Bible reminds us that God works through authority and he puts authority uh, in its place. Uh, even if we don't like it, even if we disrespect that authority, whoever's in the White House or on Capitol Hill, we may disrespect those people. We may not like them all. But Romans is clear about telling us that we need to honor those people and be praying for them and submit ourselves to them. Um, and so it is that God puts leadership in a congregation for a reason. And uh, we all need uh, to respect our eldership as they make decisions and move us into the future. So we need to be respectful. Next, we need to be contagious Christians, leading our families to be good disciples of Jesus, translated good members of his church. And... Um, it's important for us. Uh, if you are a mom or dad or a grandma or grandpa, uh, to pour into the next generation and do everything that you can uh, to build them up so that they are godly adults, not just good, responsible adults, but godly. That's the difference between the world and us. Everybody wants to raise good kids, right? God calls us to raise godly kids. Kids who honor him. Today, uh, we're going to talk about something a little bit different as we finish up. God calls us to be appreciative members of his body. We want to be talking about that. But first, I think there are three questions that we need to answer as we move through this message today. Number one, when we talk about local church membership, is it anywhere in the Bible? I phrased that differently. Is it biblically? Is there a Bible verse that says you should be a part of a local church body and place your membership or your fellowship there? Well, it would be a lot easier if there was, but the truth is there isn't. However, when you read the book of Acts, you can see it uh, progress towards that uh, that what's the, towards that end, we'll put it that way. And as you read the uh, uh, epistles, as you read the rest of the New Testament, you see that there is a focus on the local church body. Let's remind ourselves of a little history, okay? Uh, Acts chapter 2, the church is born in Jerusalem on the day of Pentecost. There are 3,000 people who respond to Peter's message that day, that first presentation of the gospel. Uh, a little while later in Jerusalem, there are 5,000 people that respond to the invitation to come to Christ. And then there's a great persecution that comes out uh, against the church, and the church is scattered. And in Acts, it reminds us that everywhere those people went, uh, whether they went to Antioch or Nazareth or Bethlehem or Miletus or wherever they went, they preached the gospel and establish churches. And so the gospel began to spread. Then the apostles began to spread the gospel outside of the walls of Jerusalem. In particular, the focus is on the apostle Paul. 
As he becomes the first real missionary, he goes into Asia Minor and Cyprus, and he plants churches in places like Ephesus, um, Troas, he plants church in Macedonia and Philippi. Uh, he plants churches everywhere and eventually ends up uh, in Rome. And so suddenly you see these local churches spring up and begin to get organized. In fact, Paul sends Timothy and Titus, both apprentices of Paul's, to respective local churches, Timothy to Ephesus, Titus to Crete, in order to appoint elders to get them organized and ready for ministry in the local body there. And so you see that even though we come into the church universal when we come to Christ, the local church plays an important part. We can't be everywhere at once, right? It's pretty hard for me to be a functioning body member of a church in Africa or a church in the Middle East or a church in India. I guess the moral of the story is God wants us to bloom where we're planted. And so he wants us to be functioning members of the body of Christ here locally in Henry County or Des Moines County or Louisa County, wherever you're from. We see that same progression as Peter in 1 Peter chapter 5 writes the local church elders in several cities uh, in Israel. And here's what he says to the elders among you. I appeal as a fellow elder and a witness of Christ's sufferings who will also share in the glory to be revealed. Be shepherds of God's flock that is under your care, watching over them, not because you must, but because you are willing as God wants you to be. We're going to stop there. So Peter addresses the elders of these local churches and says, you know what? Want you to make sure that you're good about shepherding that flock that is under your care. So the church in Jerusalem had elders. The church in Ephesus had elders. Uh, the church in Crete had elders. The church in Macedonia had elders. The church in Philippi eventually had elders. Everywhere they went, they established local churches with a local leadership. The elders weren't in charge of a district or a multitude of churches. They were responsible for that. That local church that flock that was under their care and so you see the church began to grow and expand and so it became necessary to plant local churches and establish leadership with all of those local churches next question is this why use the word gift we want to value our membership as a gift from God. You know, I never really thought of my local church membership as a gift from God. But think about it for a while. It is intertwined. It is solely dependent on our salvation. It is solely dependent on being brought into the church worldwide, the church as a whole. And our salvation is a gift, is it not? Look at Romans 6.23, For the wages of sin is death. What we earn outside of Christ, because we are lawbreakers, is separation from God, eternally death. But the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. What happens when we come to Christ and He gives us this gift? Well, in Acts 2.47, it tells us that God adds us to the church. Here's a description of the church. They were praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people, and the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. They didn't join the church. The Lord added them to the church. You don't join a church. The Lord adds you to His church. And the church in Jerusalem was established. 
Let's look at Romans 8, verses 15 and 16. The spirit you receive does not make you slaves so that you live in fear again. Rather, the spirit you receive brought about your adoption to sonship. And by him we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. When you come to Christ, you are adopted into God's family. You are brought into the church, given the spirit of adoption. When you come to Christ, you become a child of God. We use that term very loosely in America. We kind of think, well, everybody's a child of God. No. The children of God are those who are belonging to Jesus. That's who the children of God are. And when we come to Christ and surrender to Him, He adds us to His family worldwide. He adopts us in to that family worldwide and we become his child. Lastly, we've talked about this, 1 Corinthians 12, 27 and 28. Now you are the body of Christ and each one of you is a part of it. And God has placed in the church, first of all, apostles, second prophets, third teachers, then miracles, then gifts of healing, of helping, of guidance, and of different kinds of tongues. Notice who placed them? God placed them. So when we surrender to Christ and we receive the gift of eternal life, the Lord adds us to the church. He adopts us as His children. He makes us a part of the body of Christ worldwide. But we can't function in Beirut. We can't function in Nepal, India. We function locally because we have human limitations, right? And so, local membership is a gift to us as a result of eternal life being given to us. It is a gift. And so, we need to value our membership as a gift from God and bloom where we are planted. That's why we use the word gift this morning. Our salvation is a gift. Our membership in the family of God is a gift from God. He adds us daily. He brings us into the family. He puts us in a role in the body of Jesus, the church. It's all up to Him. We have little to do with it except to surrender to Him. He does it all. It's a gift from Him. And so we value that gift. And that gift was very expensive. It cost Jesus his blood, his suffering on the cross, and his death and burial. And I don't know what you think. You know, we think, well, it's not really the gift that's important. It's the thought that counts. But isn't it true, uh, if somebody gives you a bag of popcorn, you don't treat that the same as if somebody gives you a $10,000 diamond ring. Right? I mean, the popcorn, you, you know, you leave it out on the counter, uh, you munch it, you, you know, you put it in a bowl, you eat it, you spill it on the floor. Uh, a diamond ring? Oh man, that's a whole different deal. You take that and you make sure you put it away where it is safe and sound and you wear it on a special occasions. Hey, you don't treat uh, uh, your children's toys that way either. I mean, it, they're all over the place. They're usually broken in a couple of weeks. <laughs> but a precious diamond, that's a whole different deal. We value that over the long run uh, because of the price that was paid. Maybe a sacrifice that was made. And so it is with our church membership. Added to the church at a great price. Brought into the family of God. Adopted as a son or a daughter of God at a great price. Made part of the body of Christ and given a ministry at a huge price. And let's value that accordingly for a precious gift that it is. 
Thirdly, what's an appropriate response to this gift? We find ourselves in our sin. We come to Christ. He brings us into the body of Christ. We are become church members worldwide. But in particular, our focus is locally. We become a part of a local flock. Uh, and we plant our feet here. And we begin to minister here. And we begin to grow here. And we begin to, bu begin to build relationships here. All of that understanding is a gift from Him. It's nothing that we have done to earn that right. What are appropriate responses to gifts? Well, number one, joy. Isn't that part of the reason you look forward to giving your grandkids presents, you know, on Christmas Day or on birthday? You want to you see the joy. You want to see the light in their eyes. Have you ever saved up and saved up and bought something really special for your spouse or a close friend or a family member and you could hardly wait to give it because you wanted to see the look on their faces when they got it. You knew they would be filled with joy. You ever been there? Anybody? Besides me? Uh, I did, Diane raised her hand back there. I remember her dad was terrible at keeping. He, he was so anxious. He would tell you what he bought, you know, like three weeks early. He, he would always give it away because he wanted to see the look in your face. There's a joy in giving the light in your eyes. When you receive it, there's a joy as well. And that's God's desire for us. We see it all over the place in the New Testament in particular. And we see it in the book of Psalms. Jesus in John 15 prepares the disciples uh, for what's to come. And he says, I tell you all these things so that your joy might be full. And then God equips us. When we come to Christ, we become part of the members uh, of his body. We become part of his family. Um, we are added to the church and we are given the gift, another gift, and that gift is the person of the Holy Spirit who dwells inside to equip us, to strengthen us. He's called the strengthener or the comforter. And so he gives us the ability to experience joy. Galatians 5.22, the fruits of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, gentleness, meekness, and self-control. Joy is rated number three there. God doesn't just want joy for you. He puts Himself inside of you in the form of the Holy Spirit so that you can experience joy in Him. Paul experienced joy even when he was a prisoner in Rome waiting for his hearing in front of Nero. Not knowing if he would live or die, life was very uncertain and very uncomfortable and very unpleasant for him at the time. But it was there that he wrote the entire book of Philippians. And joy and rejoicing are one of the main themes of that book. And for that reason, it's one of my favorites. If you want to be encouraged in your faith, read the book of Philippians. Only four chapters. You can read it in a half hour or so. And remember where Paul was. So it's God's desire, it's Jesus' desire that we live a life of joy. And He equips us through the Holy Spirit. And we have proof of that because the, even the Apostle Paul in prison experienced joy and encourages us to rejoice always. So joy is a normal response to receiving a gift of great value, right? The second response is we're moving. Well, let me, let me back up. Let me think about this. In Luke 15, Jesus tells the parable of the uh, lost sheep. Remember that parable? It says there was a shepherd who had 100 sheep and he got, got them into the fold at night. And he counted, and he only had 99. There was one out there in the wilderness, vulnerable to predation. And so he left the 99 safe in the fold, and he went out, and he searched high and low for that one sheep that was lost. And remember what he did with it when he found it? 
He picked it up, he put it on his shoulders, he went back, he put it in the fold, and he called all of his neighbors, and they had a party. He celebrated because that which was lost was, was found. And Jesus finishes up that parable in Luke 15, verse 7, but he says, I tell you that in the same way, there will be more rejoicing in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who do not need to repent. You know what that tells us? That it brings God pleasure, it brings God joy when we experience the joy that He gives us. When we respond with joy to being adopted into His family, when we live a life of joy because we are part of the body of Christ, when we experience joy and pleasure because He added us to the church and we are active, functioning, unifying, respectful, contagious member, God rejoices as well. Our joy brings Him joy. Isn't that cool? I think all of us as parents or grandparents can identify. When your child is filled with joy, it brings you joy, right? So why should we think it's strange that our Father in Heaven gets pleasure, gets joy, when we experience joy as well. Now let's go on. Second response that is appropriate is gratitude. It's just a natural response. At least in the beginning. I, I ran across a, a little YouTube video and we're gonna, just going to play about a minute and a half of it. And I'm going to set it up for you. Uh, and the title of it is The Ten Most Thankful Kids Who Got Terrible Gifts for Christmas. And parents were setting them up, which is kind of mean. But I, I just want you to learn like I learned from this little boy as he opens up this gift. So let's play that now, and then I'll be back. I love that. Wow, chips! His parents were so tickled. I wonder really if that's in part what Jesus means. Unless you humble yourself and become as a little child, you will in no way see the kingdom of God. A natural response to receiving a gift. Very natural one as we see in this little boy who was what, maybe three? is joy and gratitude. Joy and a heart of gratitude. The problem is, as we grow, we, we move away from that. And that's why Jesus says, you got to go back to being like a little kid. If you want to see the kingdom. We, we grow out of that. We get cynical. You know, we get a lot of gifts. Some better than others. Sometimes we're disappointed. And often, especially I think when we're in an affluent society, we're not as grateful as we should be. We sort of take everything for granted. And so we need to nurture that mindset, right? We know that instinctively as parents. Uh, when you're at grandma and grandpa's and there are aunts and uncles there and your little ones open up a present and they forget to say thank you, what do you say to them? You tell them, say thank you, right? You're nurturing that. comes naturally, but sometimes we forget. 
And sometimes we grow out of that gratitude. If you received a gift that's really precious and valuable to you, you give a big hug. And it doesn't make any difference. It doesn't have to be a $10,000 diamond ring. You know, one of the most valuable presents we get are our little pieces of artwork that our grandkids or our kids made. And I still have a lot of those stored up. They all got a hug for it. Or, or you tell your kids, you know what? Let's send them a thank you note. And you send a thank you note for a gift. Gratitude and joy are a natural response to receiving a gift. The question is, is it a natural response to you or for you or in you when you think about the value this treasure of church membership that cost Jesus so much. I'm going to come in the back door on this one. But uh, as I got to thinking about that, I, I got to thinking about just what it is that it means to be brought into the church and what it means to be saved and experience salvation. And I got to thinking about Jesus when he was told by Lazarus, his close friend's sisters, that he was dead. Lazarus was dead. Been dead three days by the time Jesus got there. And Jesus uh, pulled them outside. There was a crowd there. Uh, and he walked up to Lazarus' tomb and he said, I want you to roll the stone away. And they said, no, we don't want to do that. By now there will be an odor. It'll, he will be un, very unpleasant. Je but they did it anyway out of obedience. And Jesus yelled and said, Lazarus, come forth. And Lazarus walked out with grave clothes. Can you imagine that scene? As Lazarus came out of that grave, and Jesus said, give him something to eat. He knew he'd be hungry. Give him something to eat. Get, get back to living. Lazarus was gone. They were helpless. They were hopeless. They had resigned themselves to having to live without this one that they loved dearly. And suddenly, he was given back. And I remember a lot of people and I remember my own thoughts sometimes you think you read the New Testament and you think to yourself wouldn't it be cool I would love to see Jesus raise somebody from the dead wouldn't it be awesome to see that it'd be exciting it would fill people with enthusiasm it would be it would just would be indescribable let's just raise people from the dead I just want to see that and then the reality hit that he does that all the time he does it on a daily basis and you all have been witnesses to it look at Ephesians chapter 2 verse 5 he that is Jesus made us alive with Christ even when we were dead in transgressions it is by grace that you have been saved you have been dead and there was nothing that you could do about your sin you were hopeless and you were helpless until Jesus gave you the gift of eternal life. The gift that he paid for with his own life. And you were made alive. I've seen people in 48 years of ministry that were dead in their sin. And there was nothing you could do. There isn't anything I could say. There, there's no magic formula. There's no magic word. But... We are totally dependent on God to reach into that person's heart through the Holy Spirit and His Word and transform them, make them alive. And you see them dead and then alive as they surrender to Christ. He raises the dead all the time on a daily basis. And there's rejoicing in heaven because of it. And you've been the recipient of that. You have been raised from the dead. And we are totally dependent on that. Gratitude. Are you thankful? 
Or have you become sort of jaded because you've been a Christian for a long time? Lord, forgive us for that jadedness. Help us to be like that little child again when we think about what it means to be a member of God's family. Lastly, a desire to serve. And I need to move quickly here. There are some examples. Um, Jesus was invited to a Pharisee's house for dinner. And there was a lady there uh, who was a very sinful later lady. In Luke 7, verse 38, it says, As she stood behind him at his feet weeping, she began to wet his feet with her tears. Then she wiped them with her hair, kissed them, and poured perfume on them. Her natural response to the gift of life that he gave her, the forgiveness that he gave her, the promise of, of, of uh, living with him forever that he gave her was service. She wanted to do something for him. And that's all she had. That's what she did. Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verses 1 through 3. It's another example of how receiving the gift of membership, being part of the church of God, results or births a desire to serve. There was an offering being taken for the poor church in Jerusalem, very poor church. And uh, Corinth um, was wanting to participate and did participate in that offering. In verse 8 it says, And now, brothers and sisters, we want you to know about the grace that God has given the Macedonian churches. And the midst of a very severe trial, their overflowing, what? Joy and their extreme poverty welled up in rich generosity. For I testify that they gave as much as they were able and even beyond their ability entirely on their own. So a natural response to understanding the value of this gift of being a part of God's family locally here as well as worldwide is gratitude, joy, and a desire to do something for the Lord who's done so much for us. A desire to serve and to share that joy, to share that eternal life, to share that gift. Does that make sense? And we see it often in the New Testament. And the Bible tells us we need to nurture that We need to nurture that desire to serve. John 13, Jesus is in the upper room with the disciples the night before he's crucified. And he washes their feet as an act of service. And they're a little taken aback by it because they're all about who's going to be the most powerful when he comes into his kingdom. And Jesus finishes up and in verse 15, he says, I have set you an example that you should do as I have done for you. Very truly, I tell you, no servant is greater than his master, nor is a messenger greater than the one who sends him. Now that you know these things, you will be blessed if you do them. Jesus said, be a servant. Nurture that servant spirit in your life because as you grow and you experience the disappointments of life, sometimes that desire begins to wane it sort of goes away and we get all wrapped up in ourselves and who was it that said a man all wrapped up in himself is a very small package service itself fuels joy and gratitude so here's some final thoughts we face some challenges. Thomas Rayner in his book says, you know what, a big challenge that we face in America is this idea that the church is somewhat like a country club. He said, when my dad joined the country club, I was in high school, and it was all about perks and privileges. He said, I went to play golf for free. No green fees, had a golf cart. I wanted a cheeseburger, so I went in and said, want a cheeseburger? They gave it to me for free. Went out and played some more golf, got hungry again, ordered another cheeseburger. They gave it to him for free. He said, country club membership is all about perks and privileges. Sometimes we approach the church the same way. We say to ourselves, well, you know what, I put money in the offering plate, I pay my dues. 
I, I serve, obligated to serve, even though I don't, really don't want to. So I've, I've paid my dues that way as well. And, and so there's that sense of entitlement that Thomas Rayner had when his dad joined the country club. I'm entitled to free golf. I'm entitled to a free golf cart. I'm entitled to the food that I want because I, my dad paid the dues and uh, that obliges you, that entitles me. And we have to be aware of that mentality when it comes to our membership here in the local church. We can't afford to have a congregation filled with country club churchgoers. Actually, the solution to the problem is found in Philippians chapter 2. When the Apostle Paul says, Have the same mind in you that was in Christ Jesus, who counted it not robbery to be equal with God. Do you remember that passage? He says, Do nothing out of selfish ambition, verse 3, or vain conceit, rather in humility value others above yourselves, not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of others. In your relationships with one another, have the same mind as Christ Jesus, who, being in the very nature of God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage, not privilege. Rather, he made himself nothing, but taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on the cross. Therefore, God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every other name. That at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. That's the solution to country club membership. Memorize it. Read it. Take it to heart. Pray that the Holy Spirit will allow that text to bear fruit in your life. Jesus had the right to privilege and perks. He was God. And He gave it all up and became a man, became one of us, a servant. He didn't use His Godship for his own advantage, he says. But he became a servant, obedient to the Father, even to death on the cross. And he calls us to have that same mind. To value our membership in the church worldwide and in the local church. Because it cost Jesus a great deal of suffering and agony. He paid the price for our sin. And He reminds us that that salvation is a treasure that we hold in these clay pots we call bodies. So we value our membership as a gift. And we need to nurture that. Have the same mind. The sacrificial giving. This attitude of joy. This attitude of gratitude because of what God has done for us. We experience all of those things knowing that it brings a smile to His face as well. And the angels in heaven rejoice when we are filled with joy. I have a hero. I've told you about him before. I'm going to tell you about him again just because. I think about him often when I get selfish. And I'm thinking about myself. It's about a little boy that moved into a new town. He was about eight years old. And he had trouble making friends. Uh, Mom was really worried. Uh, come Valentine's Day. He uh, spent the night before Valentine's Day writing Valentine's out for every single one of his classmates and his teachers and putting them in envelopes and come morning he put them in his backpack and she sent him on his way with a heart that was concerned about whether or not he would get any in return because he just couldn't make friends. So she baked his favorite cookies and she waited for him to come home. He was dropped off by the bus and she opened the door, stood on the front stoop and she heard him say as he walked down the sidewalk, not one. Not even one, not one, not even one. And her heart sank. 
and she scooped him up and he looked at her with a big grin on his face and he said, Mommy, I didn't forget one. I didn't forget even one. Man, that's who I want to be. Totally unconcerned about me and what I get. And totally devoted to serving people who are around me because in so doing, you serve the Lord Jesus. That's how we value our membership. And when we value that membership, we experience joy, gratitude, and a desire to serve. Meaningful ministry gives us purpose. So that's kind of where we want to leave it with you today. And I'm going to ask you, if you will, to stand with me and take just a few moments of quiet to uh, talk to God a little bit and uh, ask yourself, do I really value my membership in the Lord's Church? Do I value my membership in this local body? Is it important to me? And, how do I reflect that? How do I demonstrate that? Do I experience joy? Do I experience gratitude? Do I look for ways to serve? Because it's a gift. It's not something we're entitled to. It's not filled with perks and privileges. It's filled with challenge and service, joy and gratitude. So let's take just a few moments to go before the Lord in prayer, and I'll let you pray, and then I'll close with a prayer, and we'll be dismissed. Father, help us to wrap our minds around what it means to be a church member. You tell us in your word that when we come to Christ, you add us to the church. We don't join, you add us. It's a gift. You tell us that you adopt us into your family, not because we've earned that, not because we're entitled, but because you had mercy on us. Even while we were still sinners, you made a way for us to move from death to life. You raised us from the dead, made us alive in Christ. And Father, you give us a ministry as a part of the body of Christ on this planet. We continue the ministry that he started so many years ago. God, we ask that we'll never take that for granted. We'll value being a part of your church, knowing how much it costs. Father, we'll experience joy and a sense of gratitude and a desire to do something in turn for you and for others around us because we grasp it. We get it. And Father, in, in doing that, we experience joy. Father, forgive us for our cynicism, our laziness, our apathy, our distractions in this world. <laughs> We're so distracted. Father, there's so much out there for us. Give us the courage to take that step and to follow you no matter where you lead us, to be obedient to you no matter what, because we're a part of your church. We enjoy that gift. Father, it's in Jesus' name we ask it as we go from this place to be little Jesuses out in the community so that people will see him in us. Help us to forget ourselves and make it all about you. In his name we ask it, and in his name we go to serve. Amen. Thanks, guys.